Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ted Alexandro. Thank you, thank you guys, wow. New York City, everybody, here we are. City of dreams. That's how they bill it, right? City where dreams come true. Have you looked around? Does it look like people's dreams are coming true out there? Oh look, a Mexican man delivering Chinese food on a bicycle. Just like he always dreamed back home. A family digging through the garbage for bottles and cans because they're just that passionate about the environment. <laughs> Do what you love and the money will come. A nickel at a time. People working two and three part-time jobs into their 30s and 40s having two and three roommates. A lot of people seem to have that dream in New York. <laughs> and it is coming true. Living in New York is like one extended game of how well are you hiding your poverty? <laughs> and depression. Some days you'll hide the poverty better, other days the depression. But when you get that balance just right, oh, people say, look, that guy's dreams are coming true. Let's get a selfie with him. Everybody's hustling in New York. Overworked, underpaid. Sometimes you just get hired for jobs you didn't even apply for. I drive a 2007 Toyota Prius, charcoal gray, nondescript. But now that Uber and Lyft exist, people just get into my car <laughs> routinely. Just recently, this young woman gets in my car, announces, we're going to Brooklyn starts waving her girlfriends over. I'm like, whoa, whoa, we're not going to Brooklyn. She's like, excuse me? I'm like, I'm not a cab driver. She's like, what? I'm like, this is not a cab. I'm a person who has a car and drives himself places he needs to go. And then she was horrified when she realized that she like ran out traumatized into the embrace of her friends as if I had done something wrong. I was like, you broke into my car. And she was so sure of herself that I was like, maybe I do work for Uber. Like, is this how they hire you? Someone just gets in and is like, all right, where, where in Brooklyn? Where do you? I just want to get a good review. I hit a cop car with my car. I don't recommend doing that. I was driving home with my fiance. We were just a few blocks from home. We were passing by this cafe that I go to from time to time. I noticed it peripherally that they were open later than usual. So I turned my head like, oh, they're open later than usual. <laughs> when I turned back, the words police were getting closer and closer. I rammed into the cop car's bumper and I, my fiance to her credit didn't say anything, but I could just feel everything she was thinking. I was like, you're right. You're absolutely right about all of it. The cop car, we're at a light. The cop car turns off to a side street. So then I turn to my fiance, like, should we just get the hell out of here? Like, it's like, no, we can't do that. So then I turn and follow the cop and pull up behind him. Now all of a sudden it's like, I'm pulling him over. Like, Maybe I work for the NYPD now. So then we're just sitting and waiting. Cop finally gets out, ambles over. First thing he says is, bad idea hitting a fucking cop car. I was like, yeah, actually it wasn't my idea. It just happened. Then he was kind of like pacing around. Like, remember when you were a kid and your parents were almost like searching for the punishment? They were beside themselves. So I'm waiting, finally he's like, fuck it, I don't want to deal with this. I was like, that was my solution.
And he goes, you were never here. Which I thought was almost existential. Like, are any of us ever really, <laughs> truly here? <laughs> then he turns and walks back to his car. As he's about to get in, he turns back and says, oh, are you okay? I was like, yeah, we're fine, are you okay? He's like, yeah. Gets into his car, drives away. I turn to my fiance and say, I don't know what these black folks are complaining about. That could not have been a more pleasant exchange. I felt safe, I felt protected. I felt like my life mattered. It was like we were thrust into a commercial for white privilege. If you're not sure whether or not your life matters, I suggest that you hit a cop car. <laughs> Just see how the rest of the exchange goes. It'll be a little different for everyone. Results may vary. Some assembly required. <laughs> My fiance and I took a jar of coins to the bank. I don't know if you've ever had to do that as an adult, <laughs> but it's somewhat humiliating. You don't even get to talk to a real person. They have this animated character named Penny Arcade. She's like, would you like to take a guess at how much money you have? I was like, first of all, this is a serious financial transaction. Can I see a manager or somebody with a tie on? But secondly, yes, we would like to take a guess. Actually, that sounds like a lot of fun. We weren't prepared for that. If we could just huddle up for a moment that's within the rules. $50, that was our guess. We were way off. $123.17. Oh, we jumped as if we had won the lottery. Everyone in the bank was looking over. We were like, coins, you can turn them into real money. Get in on it, diversify your portfolio. Ask for Penny, tell her we sent you. Never been that happy in a bank before. So my fiance and I are getting married in October. Thank you. We're gonna have a heterosexual wedding, we decided. Got to discuss everything these days. You can't take anything for granted. I said, I, I identify as the groom. She's like, I feel like the bride. I was like, all right, that's one thing down. Let's talk appetizers. We had a bit of a love story. We dated 10 years ago and I fell in love with her. As Soon as I saw her, just instantly fell in love, felt that connection. But then she broke up with me. She didn't feel it the same way. She was young, she moved to Italy for school and work, and I was broken, I was devastated, I was pathetic. Have you ever been pathetic? Like really just an embarrassment? Like you can see in your friend's face, they don't even wanna be around you. It's like, oh, he's gonna tell us the story again. It was very raw, you know, you feel alive, but for all the wrong reasons started making bad decisions, started visiting her mom, <laughs> basically started dating her mom. I just needed to be close to someone who was close to her. But then finally I got my shit together, moved on, broke up with her mom. <laughs> and life was good again. I felt whole, I felt good. Years went by, dated other people, then a couple years ago, I got a text message out of the blue. How are you? And you know how you recognize the old area code? It's like, oh, 908. Look who's back. <laughs> right on time. <laughs> how are you? I was like, today or the last eight years? <laughs> the answer to both is fine. <laughs> Send. Cause you gotta be a man about it, right? Can't give it up too soon, gotta play it close to the vest. But inside I was like, dear diary, you'll never guess who's back. 
I'll give you three little hints. 908. Give up, diary. It's her. I was excited. I was very excited. We went out for coffee, then we went out to dinner, and then she moved in. <laughs> Decided to take it slow this time. <laughs> and it's funny because you know how you have different friends who react differently? You know, you have the friends who are like unconditionally supportive, hopeless romantics. My friend Danny was like, Teddy, if there's any love in this world, run towards it as fast as you can. I was like, thanks, Danny, I'm gonna do that. And I said, but don't you still live with your wife even though you got divorced five years ago? <laughs> He's like, we're talking about you right now. This isn't about me. Like, That's fair. That's fair, Dana. Then you have other friends who are more like protective of you, right? They hold a grudge for you, right? My friend was like, don't let her back. Don't let her break your heart again. I was like, I don't even know if I have a heart. I'm 48 years old. I just want to feel again. <laughs> who cares? Break my heart. So it did feel good to reconnect with the one who I always thought was the one. Because she's different, you know? She's an artist. I'm a comedian. So we've committed to a life of struggle. <laughs> but she just fascinates me. I like the way she sees the world. She's different. She was raised by lesbians. I don't mean she was abducted and taken into the wild. <laughs> She was raised, her mother was with a woman and they raised her and her siblings. And every now and then it just hits me. Just little moments, I can't even explain it. I'm just like, ah, that's right. Raised by lesbians. <laughs> they don't care for men. <laughs> I am a heterosexual man. I've always been attracted to females, but there are certain guys who make me nervous. You know what I mean? Like every now and then I'm just like, oh, hello. <laughs> like I never know when it's gonna happen. <laughs> like there's this guy that works in the bagel shop in our neighborhood. I can't even make direct, like he has the most mysterious blue eyes. I can't even look him directly in the face. Like as the line moves up, it's like, I hope I get him, but I also don't hope I get him. Like, my heart is beating faster. My mouth is dry. Finally, I get up to the front. I'm just like, cream cheese, you decide. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I'm not sexually attracted to him, but I just want him to like me. <laughs> Desperately. <laughs> So we reconnected again, it was beautiful. Uh, there was an age difference, and there still is. That's how math works. <laughs> but it feels like less now because time has gone by, we're both older. Like if I took her to my high school prom, I would have been pushing her in a stroller. <laughs> like, no, no, trust me guys, I have a good feeling this is gonna work out. <laughs> hey now, hey now, don't dream. It helps her sleep. They come, they come to do the wall between. Oh. She is in her very early 30s, and I am in my late 40s. They say a woman's sexual prime is her 30s, so she is in her sexual prime, and I am not. <laughs> I'm past my prime. Like, do you remember when Shaq played for the Celtics? That's me. He didn't look like himself anymore. He had a hard time getting up and down the court. Some nights he was really an embarrassment. 
And I bet there were nights where Shaq's teammates got very angry at Shaq and said, like, Shaq, do you even want to play with us? Do you have any passion for the game anymore? Do you care? And I'm sure Shaq was like, no, guys, it's not that at all. I love you. It's just that I'm a little older now. It takes me a little longer to warm up. Maybe if you could just fucking be a little patient. Shaq probably said to them. And I just think it was very unfair of Shaq's teammates to treat him like that. He, he was a legend. He had done a lot in the game. He deserved better. And if you look back, Shaq had some really good games for the Celtics. Not every game, not every game, but on some nights he looked like the Shaq of old and I just wish his teammates could have appreciated that instead of harping on the nights that he had difficulty performing. I feel for Shaq is what I'm trying to say. The older you get and the longer you've been with somebody, the sex isn't as important as sexual threats. You know what I mean? You just gotta throw it out there like, oh, someone's gonna get it tonight. Nobody's gonna get it. You're just gonna watch Netflix and go to bed. But it's just nice as a gesture to put it out there in the air. It's a nice thing to do. Oh, you better watch it or you're gonna get punished. Like what, go to bed? Like what's the punishment? We know what's gonna happen. I proposed on a, on a Wednesday, on a random Wednesday, just because I felt like anyone can do it on a weekend when it's supposed to be fun. You know, but I felt like Wednesday would really set her up for what our whole marriage is gonna feel like. It's gonna be a real Wednesday energy to the whole thing. And the sooner she knows that, the better. So it was very, it was just, you know, it was an exciting time being back together after all those years. At times it felt a bit like a corporate merger where certain departments are no longer needed and they were mostly the departments I was in charge of. My job is to see to it that all devices remain charged. I take it very seriously, I'm always on the prowl. I'm like, honey, give me that, you're at 11%. Thank God I was here. Crisis averted. That's what it means to be a man in 2017. Just like, uh, I think we have an outlet over here. Let me, let me keep the family safe. <laughs> 70% and above, that's my rule. Cause she'll let it get down to like the single digits. I'm like, we're not animals. I have outlets all over this place. How do you live like that? She handles all food-related decisions. She just took that over unilaterally. That's her department. I never know what's next. I just have to stay on my toes. I'm discovering that women all have this side thing as a nutritionist. It's not licensed, not certified, but they're always talking to each other, looking up articles, spreading the, the latest stuff. It's like this underground railroad of nutrition that men aren't privy to. And it's always changing. Coconut oil was a big part of our lives for a while. I don't know if you're familiar with the wonders of coconut oil, but if not, prepare to be wowed. There was nothing you couldn't do with coconut oil. You can spread it on things. You can cook with it. You can rub it on your body and moisturize. You can put it in your hair if you have hair. You could whiten your teeth. We were so happy, the three of us together. Then one morning, I don't know what happened, she must have read an article. We were done with coconut oil. I don't know why, but her reasons are my reasons. She's angry, so I'm angry. We're done with it forever. We're on to miso. I don't know how long it's gonna last. I can't question, but I don't wanna get too attached to miso. Smoothies are another big part of our lives. I didn't see that coming. Smoothies. Because when you're single, a smoothie is just like a fun word that you remember from time to time. Like, oh yeah, maybe I'll have one of those eventually. But when you're part of a couple, a smoothie is so much more. Oh, it's like a relationship lubricant. You always have something to talk about. The next smoothie. 
What are we gonna have? What do we have? Do we have baby spinach? Do we have berries? Are they in season? Do we have avocado? Is it in that five minute window when it's still good? Do we have the milk of some sort of nut? The nuts are all battling it out to see who could be milkiest. We always have fruits and vegetables in the house now. I didn't realize it, but when you're in a couple, you eat the fruits and vegetables that you buy. <laughs> that was a revelation for me. Because when you're single, if you buy a fruit or a vegetable, it's like a wish that will very likely not come true. We always do like, you know, different food related things. Like she goes, you want to do a food challenge? I'm like, what, like who could eat more wings? She's like, no, no, we're eliminating gluten, dairy, oils, and fun. I'm like, no, you win that challenge. I'm, I'm out. We did a cleanse, a 30 day cleanse. I was starving for 30 days. I was so hungry. It was such an unfamiliar feeling to be that hungry. Cause you see those commercials where they're like millions of Americans go to bed hungry every single night. I was like, yeah, I know, I'm one of them. And in a way, it's even more impressive because I have access to food. Like, I can't end world hunger, but I can end my hunger. I would get these cryptic texts from her when I'm on the road. All of a sudden, my phone is like, bananas aren't clean. I'm like, I'll tell the others. Like, what is this, a drug deal? Like, I just want to eat my breakfast. Bananas aren't clean. <laughs> Bananas aren't clean, motherfucker. Banana, tell the others. Bananas aren't clean. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, really, baby? They aren't clean? <laughs> we watch a lot of documentaries. I've never met anybody who's seen more documentaries than my fiance. I, I, I literally think that the, the eight years we were apart, she just watched documentaries the entire time. Because anytime one comes up, I'm like, oh, let's watch that. She's like, I already saw it. I'm like, it just came out. She's like, I, I was there when they shot it. We watched this documentary called Banana Land. If you like bananas, I do not recommend watching Banana Land. Like every documentary, it will fucking ruin what you love forever. I won't tell you the whole thing, but I'll, uh, if I could distill it down to a single line. Towards the end of Banana Land, this woman, this Central American banana farmer, looks right into the camera and says, just remember, the next time you eat a banana, you're eating pure violence. Great, you know, I sh knew we shouldn't have watched this. Pure violence? We happen to like our smoothies with pure violence. When my fiance first moved in, uh, we were fighting a lot, and it was difficult because uh, she's good at it. And I'm getting better, uh, and by that I mean I'm learning to say I'm sorry. I make it a habit, I say it regularly. I say, babe, I love you, please forgive me, I'm sorry. And then she says, well, you can't just say I'm sorry, it's not just about saying the words I'm sorry, you have to understand what you did, you can't just say I'm sorry and it's over. And I say, you're right, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I apologize. And then she says, well, it's not like this is the first time I've said this to you, I've said it many times before, you just keep doing the same thing over and over again, when are you gonna get it through your head? And then I say, what the fuck? I'm not Hitler, I'm just a human being. Maybe you can cut me some slack. Actually, I say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I apologize. Because I love her. I love her very much, but I disappoint her a lot. I've never been this disappointing to another human being. It's very unfamiliar terrain. 
But I'm realizing that that's what love is. Disappointment. When you find someone who you disappoint regularly, hold on to that person because you have found true love. <laughs> to be fair, sometimes after a fight, she'll come up to me kind of sheepishly and say, babe, I'm sorry. I think I'm getting my period. And I say, no, no, we're getting our period. <laughs> because it is a shared suffering. <laughs> she suffers physically. And I do not. <laughs> and I get it. I think, you know, women have it harder in this world. I think men walk around with a degree of privilege every single day that they'll never fully comprehend. Or so I'm told. <laughs> No, I, b I believe that's true. I think men have it easier. I think women put up with so much shit from men their entire lives, from the time they're little girls, whether it's family, teachers, classmates, coaches, bosses, colleagues, random assholes on the street, that by the time they settle on you, it's like they finally got through to customer service. And you are gonna get an earful because they are not happy with the product. Oh yeah, they have got some complaints that they've been sitting on for a very long time and you just picked up. You're gonna be tempted to say things like, oh no, I'm sorry, that's not my department, let me transfer you. But guess what, it's all your department now. You're the only one in the department. So just get used to saying things like, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I apologize, and you have a shot of keeping your job. <laughs> 48 years old, I find myself waking up injured now. That's a new thing. Go to sleep perfectly fine, wake up with like a strained calf. I don't remember running in the night. I thought I was just laying flat for eight hours. Apparently I have to stretch before I sleep. I feel like I'm always masking at least two injuries. And then as soon as one heals, two more appear. It's just like, they're never fully healed. And I know I look all right, but I'm like a lemon. You know when they describe a car as a lemon? Looks nice, but then under the hood, they're like, oh, looks like it was in a flood down south. <laughs> I was in Hawaii, I had a, a gig in Maui. Beautiful, amazing. I don't know if you've ever been, it's just the most majestic place. I was standing on the shore, looking out at the most Blue, beautiful ocean, an equally majestic blue sky, just contemplating life. A wave washed ashore, hit my knee, it buckled, and it's still not the same. I don't think it'll ever be the same. That's where I'm at, water is a threat. I went to see a doctor, he's like, were you playing basketball? I was like, no, I was standing still. I was relaxing. <laughs> I've been peeing sitting down. Decided to start that phase of my life. I wish I knew about it sooner. I didn't realize it was an option. The old guys make you figure it out for yourself. It's like this Zen thing, you have to just learn it. Oh, it's just gorgeous. And I don't use that word, but it's just such a game-changing, gorgeous thing. I just, you know, just sit there. You know, I'm not even talking about, like, be productive, take your phone out, get things done. I'm just talking about sitting down, just seeing what happens. Let the young guys stand, right? Got hopes and dreams, making plans. Got a stream you can depend on? 
Not me. I got a spotty flow. I'm like an old rapper. There's a lot of, uh, uh. What, what? Make some noise. I'm a big basketball fan. And I realized that it's kind of common knowledge that the first black baseball player was Jackie Robinson, 1947, Brooklyn Dodgers. But I realized I don't know who the first black NBA player was. I think it was just the entire NBA. <laughs> like one day it was all white, the very next day it was all black. They were like, you don't have to show up anymore. We just realized you suck at basketball. <laughs> We've made a horrible mistake. You could be a ref. You could coach the team, you could own the team, you could literally do any other job. You just can't play anymore. And some of those white guys are, are still in the Hall of Fame who didn't play against black guys. The Hall of Fame, you know what? Get the fuck out of the Hall of Fame. How dare you? You could work at the Hall of Fame, you could give tours, you could sweep up. You're just not allowed to be in the Hall of Fame. Racism was really like the first steroids. Like a performance enhancing drug. Like your performance is definitely enhanced if you're just playing basketball against other white guys. There's a league now of all white guys. There still is a league. It's called Division Three College Basketball. And it's awful, it's unwatchable. But if this was 1940, they would be in the Hall of Fame. I was thinking about how we're all replaceable. You know, I think we're all replaceable and I take great solace in that. Some people resist that, you know, because they, they attribute it like to work or achievement. You know, they're like, no, 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 at my job, I'm the only one, you're not the only one. But I'm working on this project, nobody gives a shit about your project. It's stupid, don't show up to work for a few days and someone else will take over your stupid project. We're all replaceable. And I take comfort in that. Steve Jobs, Apple, genius, right? The year that he died, I read that the very next year, Apple had its best year ever. There you go. If Steve Jobs is replaceable, we're all replaceable. Steve Kerr, coach of the Golden State Warriors, a few years ago, he led them to the uh, championship. The very next year, he had back surgery, he was out. His assistant took over, they went 24 and 0 and went on to the best record in NBA history. The next year he hurt his back again, a different assistant stepped in. They went all the way to the finals undefeated and finally lost when he came back. <laughs> Steve Kerr, great coach, very replaceable. And Viv on the Fresh Prince. She thought she was irreplaceable. Guess what, Aunt Viv? Season three, you're out. We're all just Aunt Viv in our way through life. So guys, as of the beginning of my set, uh, Donald Trump is still our 45th and final president. Not looking good, everyone. It's like mainlining anxiety with this guy, right? You have to think about him every single day. Like from the moment you wake up, you know he's coming for you. Right? Every day. I don't even think about my family every day. I gotta think about this guy. Just gotta like, think about it. Like, well, what do you got? What do you got? What do you got, Donald? What do you got? What is it? Russia? What do you got? Huh? North Korea? What is it? Oh, I just tweet it right into my fucking bloodstream. Come on. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. Oh, it's so exhausting, right? It's starting to feel like we're the senior class of Earth. Right? Like, if there is an afterlife, and there isn't, we're gonna walk in like, -na -na -na. <laughs> we ended it. <laughs> what did you guys do? <laughs> hey, Thomas Edison, light bulb. 
No more light. <laughs> Rosa Parks. No, no, no. Stay seated. <laughs> Donald, it's so, it's so anxiety-inducing, right? It's like, it's like post-traumatic stress without the post. <laughs> Present traumatic stress. It's so exhausting, especially in this age of yoga and meditation, mindfulness, being present in the now. Trump is like the opposite of all that. Like, if you take yoga, Trump is what you've been preparing for the whole time. Your teacher's like, everyone, this is not a test. This is it, this is the real thing. Just breathe, root yourself in your practice, and be present in the now while we still have a now. This is called downward spiraling society. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just stage dive? <laughs> it feels appropriate. <laughs> Donald Trump's campaign slogan was Make America Great Again, but it might as well have been Fuck Yoga. <laughs> Do you remember the night of the election as the return started coming in? You start to have like that conspiracy brain going, right? You know, Trump was ahead early. And I was like, I see what they're doing. They're gonna let him get ahead early, keep us watching. Then at the end of the night, Hillary will be president. Then later in the night, they're like, Trump's still ahead. It's still too close to call. We'll tell you in the morning. I was like, I see what they're doing. They're gonna let us go to sleep. Think he's gonna be president in the morning. Hillary will be president. Then in the morning, they're like, Trump's president. I was like, I see what they're doing. They're gonna swear him in, let him govern for four years, and then Hillary will be president. Part of me felt bad for Hillary, just in the sense that she's always like the sure thing, can't lose, always loses. It's almost like they're playing this game of, what would it take to get you to vote for Hillary Clinton? Hear me out. What if she ran against a black guy with the middle name Hussein? No? Wow, this is gonna be a lot harder than I thought. Okay, okay. All right, how about this? An orange reality television star, no experience, racist and sexist. Still no, holy shit. You really don't seem to like her. Everyone threatened to move to Canada on both sides, right? Didn't matter who you were voting, I'm moving to Canada. It's like, we get it. If your candidate loses, you're moving to the whitest English-speaking country you can drive to. What about Mexico? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I'm not that progressive. I remember when Barack Obama got elected, a lot of people said, I wish my grandparents had lived to see this, the first black president in American history. And I know how they feel now. I wish my grandparents had lived to see Trump get elected because they were racist and this would have been very, very special for them <laughs> on account of how racist they were. <laughs> they weren't just racist, they had other interests. Like my grandmother was an excellent baker, but she was a racist baker and you could always taste it. There was always something off in every recipe. Like, Nana, what is that spice? Ah, racism, of course. I should have guessed. Now I'm not saying that everyone who voted for Trump is racist. I'm saying my grandparents were. And if you voted for Trump, you probably would have liked them. To be fair to my grandparents, they weren't racist at the time. They were just white. <laughs> but a lot of times, white is just like racist that hasn't been diagnosed yet. It's like you get the test results back years later, like, oh, uh, we got your results. You were very racist the whole entire time. You should have been tested more regularly. You're in a very high-risk group.
I voted for Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary, like most people. I just think that Bernie is the face of America right now. Bernie Sanders is 74 years old, and he's still looking for a job. What could be more American than that? But it was like a reality show, right? The, the, the whole election cycle. It was kind of hard to look away. It was, it was like governing with the stars, or like a reality show. I like the early episodes though, right? Bernie and Hillary. They almost felt like your grandparents, but from opposite sides of the family. <laughs> Bernie was like the fun grandpa who makes sure that everybody's sharing. And Hillary's like, fuck, Grandma Hillary's coming this weekend. This is gonna suck. Smile for Grandma Hillary. Trump's like your mentally ill uncle who just shows up unannounced. You never know what he's gonna say or do. Like, no, no, just let him talk. This is gonna be interesting. Just keep him away from the grill. And the gardeners. <laughs> so I don't know, I don't know. Is voting the answer? I doubt it. People get mad if you don't vote, they'll yell at you. How dare, how dare you? How? How dare you? People died so you can vote. Yeah, and people are gonna die because you vote. Enjoy your sticker. Right, it's just, it's so disheartening. That's never discussed. It's never discussed. Continuous murder. We're always just electing the next murderer in chief. Sometimes we feel good about it, right? Sometimes we feel progressive. We had a black murderer in chief. Oh, that so, felt so progressive. And we almost had a woman murdering around the globe. Oh. Right? Breaking the glass ceiling and then the shards of glass falling, murdering people. Oh. Oh my God. Then the ex-presidents, once they're out of office, right? They do a 180, they, they rebrand. Obama's going windsurfing with billionaires. George W. Bush is a painter all of a sudden. Oh, right? How the fuck did that, George W. Bush? Right, he's like Mr. Magoo with a paintbrush all of a sudden, <laughs> taking selfies with Michelle Obama and Ellen. He's so likable and fun, right? He did a reverse Hitler. <laughs> Hitler was a painter and then he murdered a lot of people. <laughs> they said, never forget, George, we, we didn't forget. It all goes by so quickly though, right? Sometimes you forget, it all just goes by so quickly that you forget. Do you remember when Jeb Bush was the presumptive nominee? You remember that? It was supposed to be Jeb Bush against Hillary Clinton, right? Just like God ordained the two royal families battling it out. Jeb Bush just disappeared, but he resurfaced recently. Did you hear what happened? He bought the Miami Marlins baseball team. That was his plan B. Maybe I'll be president, maybe I'll buy a baseball team. <laughs> Nothing takes the edge off losing like owning some human beings, huh? <laughs> Historically speaking, that really takes the edge off. <laughs> and he wasn't even the first person in his family to do that. George W. Bush owned the Texas Rangers, I think in the 90s, the fourth place Texas Rangers. Couldn't even figure out the American League, we put him in charge of America. <laughs> Donald Trump. In the 80s, he owned the New Jersey Generals of the now defunct USFL. Doesn't exist anymore, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> and recently, Trump got into trouble for claiming to know more about ISIS than the Generals. And it finally occurred to me, like, oh, he probably meant the New Jersey Generals. <laughs> that makes a little more sense. Still probably wrong, but at least it does make some sense. Don, I call him Don Trump every now and then. Just takes the edge off, Don. <laughs> Just hits the ear different, right? Donald Trump, Don Trump. Almost sounds like a personal injury lawyer. Like, Don Trump, have you been injured or in an accident? <laughs> Dial D-O-N-T-R-U-M and leave the last P all over me.
Martin Luther King Jr. if he was just Marty King? I don't know, would you be on board with his dream? Marty King probably just wants to play Vegas. Marty King, limited time only. At Caesar's Palace. Mother Teresa, if she was just Mama Terry. Hey, Mama Terry, when you're here, you're famished. <laughs> Why does Mother Teresa have an Italian restaurant? She was a bad businesswoman. Wonderful woman, horrible business. Woman. Jesus was a bad businessman too. Right, just gave everything away for free. That's why there's no Jesus School of Economics. <laughs> People will say, Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. Do you ascribe to his economic policy? <laughs> I was raised Catholic, and now I'm not. That's usually the end of that sentence. Rarely you hear, I was raised Catholic, and now I'm fucking really Catholic. <laughs> I think it's a good starter kit, Catholicism. It's good for kids. You have good characters, Jesus and Santa Claus, right? When you're a kid, those are the two characters. Both great guys giving things away for free. Both socialists, basically. That's what you're indoctrinated with. Santa going around the world, just giving people toys. Jesus turning one thing into another thing, giving it away for free. Water into wine at the wedding when they ran out. It's not like, oh, and then Jesus made a fucking killing because it's a wedding and they need wine, right place, right time, market, <laughs> supply and demand, fucking Jesus. <laughs> if Jesus came back now, the bar would be so much lower. He wouldn't have to turn water into wine. He could just turn water into clean drinking water. <laughs> Show up in Flint, Michigan, the people would be like, Jesus, it's a miracle, we can drink this? Yeah, please, go ahead, drink it. I just put a Brita filter on it, it's just, it's not even a miracle, really. What's it about, though, right? What's it about? You can't just walk around feeling dispirited. I think it's about the movements, the movements that have been coalescing. Even before Trump got into office, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter. Some people say, whoa, 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 whoa what about all lives? Don't all lives matter? Yeah, they do. But this is called Black Lives Matter. <laughs> they already decided on a name. <laughs> and if your first contribution to the movement is suggesting a name change, maybe you're not as in it as you think you are. <laughs> Just show up to a couple more meetings and stand in the back quietly. <laughs> the movements, right? Fight for 15. The Muslim ban, people showed up, flooded the airports all over the country. People showed up for these people who were being banned. A lot of people are refugees, leaving violent oppression, fleeing, running for their lives. Have you ever moved? That sucks. You have to waste a whole weekend. You gotta get boxes, a van, bother your friends. My last move was from the second floor to the fourth floor of the same building. And it was an ordeal I hope I never have to go through ever again. I'm still scarred. There wasn't a war on the second floor. I just had a better view on the fourth. The movements, Dakota Pipeline, the Pepsi movement. <laughs> if you didn't hear about the Pepsi movement, let me fill you in. Pepsi did this commercial that caused a bit of a stir because they kind of co-opted all of these movements that have been going on and they spit it out as commercialism. In this commercial, Kendall Jenner, who was a person I just found out about, She's of the house and lineage of Jenner. <laughs> She's on a photo shoot, a very glamorous photo shoot. There's a wind machine, I think. 
And as she's on this photo shoot, a protest march goes by. And people are holding signs with such nuanced messages as peace and love. You know those peace and love marches we've been seeing so much of? Catches Kendall Jenner's eye, but that's not what gets her in. A little later on, there's this cute boy who kind of flirts with her and beckons her into the movement. And that's when Kendall Jenner realizes, hey, I think I'm down with the peace and love movement. She rips off her blonde wig, of course, wipes off her lipstick, you know, gets protest ready. And not only does she join the movement, she goes right to the front lines. And what does she do? She gives a police officer an ice cold Pepsi. Everyone cheers and world peace is declared thanks to Kendall Jenner and Pepsi. Oh, how could you possibly be offended by that? On the bright side, at least we finally found our first paid protester. But I don't blame Kendall Jenner, come on. She's a 13-year-old girl who doesn't know whether her father's her mother or her mother's her father. She's got a lot to sort through. I blame the comedians and actors who do commercials for the big banks just years after the banks crashed the economy and then they're doing fun commercials like, hey, what's in your wallet? Not much, asshole, what's in yours? Have you been paying attention at all to what's going on? You really think that's a good idea? But it's just, you know, that's the culture now. Everyone's for sale, right? How did we, how did we get here? Journalists like to ask that, right? Coming up next, how did we get a President Trump? Oh, I don't know. Have you ever been watching a television show or a movie where a journalist appears as themselves? Wolf Blitzer suddenly on House of Cards playing Wolf Blitzer? I don't know, Wolf, how did we get here? <laughs> Rachel Maddow playing Rachel Maddow. All of them, Brian Williams, Anderson Cooper. How did we get here? I don't know, maybe because when you're interviewing Frank Underwood one minute and Donald Trump the next, we don't believe you anymore. You're not a journalist, you're an actor. Maybe that's the problem, Wolf. Maybe that's how we got here. Maybe because your role on House of Cards means more to you than your role as the fourth estate in our democracy. Maybe that's how we got here. And by the way, I'm not criticizing their acting. Wolf Blitzer gave a very fine performance <laughs> as Wolf Blitzer. Very, very convincing. It was nuanced. I believed entirely that he was a fake journalist with no integrity. <laughs> and wonderful hair, wonderful hair. But they're all cut from the same cloth, right? That's the culture now. Fame whores, just looking for money, looking for a higher profile. There's no difference between Kendall Jenner and Donald Trump. In the 90s, Donald Trump did Pizza Hut commercials. Pizza Hut. Do you know who owned Pizza Hut? Pepsi. We are about 20 years and a sex change operation away from President Ken Jenner, and I plan on voting for him because he's got a long track record with the peace and love movement. So it's the movements, everybody, it's the movements. We, the senior class of Earth, are tasked with doing what we can. You have to join the movement, see what's going on, plug in, right? All the marches, the women's march, the climate march, the science march, the scientists are marching. That's how bad it's gotten. <laughs> they don't even like going outdoors, they have shit to research, they should be inside. They have to give up a Saturday because the president doesn't believe in climate science, thinks it's a hoax. You know the way those scientists are always trying to pull a fast one on us. <laughs> oh, you rapscallions. <laughs> Fool me once and then prove it over and over and over again. And have it reviewed by your peers until it's a fact. Trump 
was talking about immigrants and Muslims. I'm from New York City. Immigrants and Muslims? Oh, you mean the people who make our lives convenient and delicious? <laughs> First of all, we're all immigrants. I'm not from Earth. Are you? I have no idea how I got here. I don't know how long I'm allowed to stay. But I don't think I've ever had a meal in New York City that wasn't either prepared or delivered by an immigrant. Almost every cab in New York driven by a Muslim. For New Yorkers, a Muslim extremist is just someone who gets you there faster. It's like, whoa, I think that light was red. That's a little extreme. I remember the week of Trump's inauguration. Do you remember that, the week of Trump's inauguration? It began, if you remember, on the Monday with MLK Day, and then it ended on Friday with Trump's inauguration. Struck me as odd bookends. MLK, a man who told us to judge people not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I don't know what's more disturbing, the color of Trump's skin or the content of his character. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much.